Live from Boston, it's theCUBE. Covering IBM Chief Data Officer Summit. Brought to you by IBM. Welcome back everyone to the IBM CDO Summit and theCUBE's live coverage. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Paul Gillen. We have Joe Selly joining us. He is the Cognitive Solution Lead at IBM and Thomas Ward, Supply Chain Cloud Strategist at IBM. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Our pleasure. Pleasure to be here. So, Tom, I want to start with you. You are the author yeah. of Risk Insights. Tell our viewers a little bit about Risk Insights. Yeah, so, so Risk Insights is an AI application. We've been working on it for a couple years. Uh, what's really neat about it, it's the coolest project I ever worked on, um, and, and it really gets a massive amount of data from the weather company, so we're one of the biggest consumers of data from the weather company. We take that and we visualize who's at risk from things like hurricanes, earthquakes, things like IBM sites and locations or suppliers, and we uh, basically notify them in advance when those events are going to impact them, and, and uh, it, it uh, ties to both our data center uh, operations activity as well as our supply chain operations. So you reduce your risk, your supply chain risk by being able to proactively detect potential outages. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so we know in some cases two or three days in advance who's in harm's way and we're already looking up and trying to mitigate uh, th those risks uh, if, if we need to. It's going to be a real serious event. So Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Florence, we were right on top of it and said we got to worry about these suppliers, these data center locations, and we we're already working on that in advance. That's very cool. So yeah. I mean, how, how are clients and customers, I mean, this has got to be a, uh, as you said, it's the coolest project you've ever worked right. on. Yeah, so, so right now we use it within IBM, right? Mm -hmm and, and uh, we, we use it to monitor some of IBM's client locations. Um, and in the future, we, we're actually, there was something called a call for code that happened recently within IBM. This, was, this project was a semi-finalist for that. So we're now working with some nonprofit groups to see how they could also avail of it, looking at things like hospitals and airports and those types of things as well. What other AI projects are you running? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I can answer that one. I just wanted to say one thing about Risk Insights, which didn't come out from Tom's description, which is th that one of the other really neat things about it is that it provides alerts, smart alerts, out to supply chain planners. And the alert will go to a supply chain planner if there's an intersection of a supplier of IBM and a path of a hurricane. If the hur hurricane is vectored to go over that supplier, the supply chain planner that is responsible for those parts will get some forewarning to either start to look for another supplier or um, make some contingency plan. And then the other nice thing about it is that it launches what we call a resolution room. And the resolution room is a virtual meeting place where people all over the globe um, who are somehow impacted by this event can collaborate, share documents, and have a persistent place to resolve this issue. And, and then, after that's all done, we capture all the data from that, that issue and the resolution, and we put that into a body of knowledge, and we mine that knowledge for a playbook the next time a similar event comes along. That so becomes it's a, a full, machine learning uh, It's a machine learning, source. it's a full soup to nuts um, solution that gets smarter so over you time. You should be able to measure benefits. You should have measurable be benefits by now, right? What are you seeing? Uh, yeah. Fewer so, disruptions? Yes, so, so in Risk Insights, we know that out of the thousands of events that occurred, there were 25 in the last year that were really the ones we needed to identify and mitigate against. And out of those, we know there have been circumstances where in the past, IBM's had millions of dollars of losses. By being more proactive, we're really minimizing that amount. That's incredible. Um, so, so you were going to talk about the other kinds of AI that you run. Right, well so Tom gave an overview of Risk Insights and we tied it to supply chain and to um, monitoring the uptime of our customer data centers and things like that. But our portfolio of AI is quite broad. It really covers most of the middle and back and front office functions of IBM. So we have things in the sales domain, the finance domain, the HR domain, y you name it. Um, one of the ones that's particularly interesting to me of late is in the finance domain, monitoring accounts receivable and DSO, day sales outstanding. So a company like IBM with multiple billions of dollars of revenue, to make a change of even one day of day sales outstanding provides gigantic benefit to the bottom line. So we have been uh, integrating disparate databases across the business units and geographies of IBM, pulling that customer and accounts receivable data into one place where our CFO can look at an integrated 
approach towards our accounts receivable. And we know where the problems are, and we're going to use um, AI and other advanced analytic techniques to determine what's the best treatment for that AI, for those customers who are at risk because of our predictive models of not making their payments on time or some, some sort of financial risk. So we can, we can integrate a lot of external unstructured data with our own structured data around customers, around accounts, and pull together a story around AR that we've never been able to pull before. So that's very so, impactful. So speaking of unstructured data, I understand the data lakes are part of your AI platform. Uh, how so? Yep. So, so uh, for example, for Risk Insights, we're monitoring hundreds of trusted news sources at any given time. So we know um, not just where the event is, what locations are at risk, but also what's being reported about it. We monitor Twitter uh, reports about it, we monitor trusted news sources like uh, CNN or MSNBC or uh, you know, uh, on a global basis. So, so it gives our risk analysts not a, just a view of where the event is, where it's located, but also what's being said, uh, how severe it is, how big are those uh, tidal waves, how big was the storm surge, uh, you know, how many, how many people were affected. And by applying some of the machine learning insights to these, now we can say, well, if there are uh, a couple hundred thousand people without power, then it's very likely that there's going to be multi-millions of dollars of impact as a result. So we're now able to correlate those news reports with the magnitude of impact and potential fi financial impact uh, to, to the businesses that we're supporting. So the, the idea being that IBM is saying, look what we've done for our own business. <laughs> what, imagine what we could do for you. I mean, it, as, as, we've, as Interpol has said, it, it's really using IBM as its own test case and trying to figure this all out and, and learning as it goes. And he said, we're going to make some mistakes. We've already made some mistakes, but we're, we're figuring it out so you don't have to make those mistakes. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you think about the long, um, the long history of this, we've been investing in AI really since depending on how you look at it, since the days of the 90s when we were doing Deep Blue and we were trying to beat Gary Kasparov at chess. And then we did another big, huge push to on the Jeopardy program where we in innovated around natural language understanding and speed and scale of processing and probability correctness of answers. And then we kind of carried that right through to the current day where we're now proliferating AI across all of the functions of IBM. And there, then connecting to your comment, Interpol's comment this morning was around, let's just use all of that for the benefit of other companies. Um, it doesn't, it's not always an exact fit, it's never an exact fit, but there are a lot of pieces that can be replicated and borrowed, either people, process, or technology from our experience that would help to accelerate other companies down the same path. One of the questions around AI though is, can you trust it? The insights that it derives, are they trustworthy? Well, I'll, I'll give a quick answer to that, and then Tom, that's probably something you might want to chime in on. There's a lot of, of danger in AI, and it needs to be monitored closely. Um, there's bias that can creep into the data sets because the data sets are being enhanced with cognitive techniques. There's bias that can creep into the, the algorithms, and any kind of learning model can start to spin on its own axis and go in its own direction, and if you're not watching, and monitoring and auditing, then it could be starting to deliver you crazy answers. Then the other part is you need to build the trust of the users because who wants to take an answer that's coming out of a black box? We've launched several AI projects where the answer just comes out naked, if you will, just sitting right there and there's no context around it and the users never like that. So we've, we've understood now that you have to put the context, the underlying calculations, and the uh, assessment of our own probability of being correct in there. So those are some of the things you can do to get over that. But Tom, yeah. do you have anything to uh, add to I'll that? I'll just give an example. When we were early in analyzing Twitter tweets about a major storm, what we read about was, uh, oh, some celebrity's dog was in danger. It's like, <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> this isn't very I'm helpful guess, insights. I, I probably know the celebrity's <laughs> I, dog I, that I, was I, in danger. I, I stopped saying <laughs> that. So, so, so we learned how to filter those things out and say, what are the meaningful uh, keywords that we need to p extract from and really then can draw conclusions from. So is Kardashian a meaning? Word, I, guess. <laughs> I guess that's the question. It's trending. <laughs> it's trending now. But I want to I want to follow up on that because you, you, as a, as an AI developer, you know what what responsibility do developers have to show their work? 
to document how they've uh, how their models have have worked. Yeah. So so all of our information that we provide to the users all draws back to here's the original source. Here's here's where the information was taken from, so we can draw back on that. And that's an important part of having a cognitive data and a cognitive enterprise data platform where all this information is stored because then we can refer to that and go deeper as well. And we can analyze it further after the fact, right? You can't always respond in the moment, but once you have those records, that's how you can learn from it for the next time around. I understand that building test models in some cases, particularly in deep learning, is very difficult uh, to build reliable test models. Is, is that true and what, what progress is being made there? So, so in our case, we're into the machine learning dimension yet. We're not all the way into the deep learning in, in the project that I'm involved with right now. But uh, one, one reason we're not there is because you need to have huge, huge, vast amounts of robust data and, and that trusted uh, data set from which to work. So we're, we aspire towards and are heading towards deep learning. We're, we're not quite there yet, but uh, we, we've started with machine learning insights and we'll progress from there. Well, and one of the interesting things about this AI um, movement overall is that it's, it's filled with very um, energetic people. There's kind of a hacker mindset to the whole thing. So people are grabbing and running with code. They're using a lot of open source. There's a lot of integration of a black box from here, from there, and the other place, which all adds to the risk of the output. So that comes back to the original point, which is that you have to monitor, you have to make sure that you're comfortable with it, and you can't just let it run on its own course without really testing it to see whether you agree with the, the outputs. So what other best practices? I mean, and there's, there's the monitoring, but at the same time, you, you do that, that hacker culture, that's not all bad. I mean, you want people no, no, who are energized yeah. by it and who are trying new things and experimenting. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure you, you let them have uh, sort of enough rain, but not free rain. I, I would say w the, what comes to mind is start with a business problem that's, that's a real problem. Don't make this an experimental data thing. Start with a business problem. Develop a POC, a proof of concept, small, and here's where the hackers come in. They're going to help you get it up and running in six weeks as opposed to six months. And then once you're at the end of that six week period, maybe you design one more six week iteration and then you know enough to start scaling it and you scale it big. So you've harnessed the hackers, the energy, the speed, but you're also testing and making sure that it's accurate and then you're scaling it. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tom and Joe. I really appreciate it. It's great to have you on the show. Yep. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Paul. I'm Rebecca Knight for Paul Gillen. We will have more from the IBM CDO Summit just after this.